Welcome to the Museum at FIT's online symposium devoted to shoes. My name is Tania Melendez Escalante, and I am Senior Curator of Education and Public Programs. It is my honor to welcome Elizabeth Semelhack, Senior Curator at the Bata Shoe Museum in Toronto, who will discuss high heels and their history. I hope you enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Elizabeth Semelhack, and I'm the Director and Senior Curator of the Bata Shoe Museum. I am a shoe historian with a very, very long history of being interested in the origins of footwear. And one of the most fascinating of them all is a high heel. I have been able to trace the origin of the high heel as far back as 10th century Persia. I do believe it goes back even further. And it seems to have been invented as an equestrian tool to be worn in tandem with the stirrup. By the 10th century, Persians were wearing heels and then slowly over the centuries, heel use began to spread uh, throughout Western Asia and even to the edges of Eastern Europe. But my next question was, why did heels only become of interest to Western Europeans sometime around the turn of the 17th century? They assuredly knew about the high heel, Images such as this print from 1577 prove that they had awareness of Persians and heel wearing. Um, examples of Persian heels and other heels worn in Western Asia had made it into small collections around Europe. But it really wasn't until world European uh, imperialism began world exploration, for lack of a better term, began. And for countries like England and Holland, they first, they didn't go into ships first, what they did was they went overland and they came in contact, the, the English first, with Persia as a potential trading partner. And it just so happened to also be at a time when Persians were interested in increasing east-west trade. And by the turn of the 17th century, one of Persia's most important leaders, Shah Abbas I, came to power, and he very much wanted to make European alliances. And what he brought to the table was one of the largest mounted militaries in the world, and they all wore heeled footwear. And so it's my thesis that it was this new interest in Persia, the potentials of Persia as both a trading and military partner that made it that European men were first eager to have heels added to their riding boots. But of course, we know that heels have come to be um, a signifier of femininity. So how was it that women began to wear heels? Well, around the turn of the 17th century and certainly in the early opening decades of that century, uh, there was a trend in Western European women's fashion to borrow elements of masculine dress. And so here we have um, a text from 1620, and it's actually complaining about the mannish woman, but he is being, con uh, uh, sorry, the womanish man, but he is being compared to the mannish woman. And you can see that she has on a hat with plumes, uh, similar to what was fashionable for men. She has uh, a uh, a pistol, she has a sword, and she's the one who's wearing heeled riding boots, similar um, to the pair that you can see this close up from the Rubens uh, de Medici cycle. And the man who is being criticized for his effeminacy is the one who is in flats. So it appears that women began to add heels to their wardrobe, or women's fashion encouraged women to add heels to their wardrobes in the effort to masculinize their attire. Of course, the 17th century uh, is full of heeled footwear for both men and for women, but gender difference does begin to make itself known quite early on. So while the very, very first heels for both men and women were wooden and leather covered, stacked leather, another Western Asian form of making heels, also became a part of European fashion. For men, stacked leather heels become what you find on riding boots. This is why cowboys still wear stacked leather heels. And this is, in fact, why businessmen today still wear stacked leather heels, even though they're very low. And leather covered heels become more associated with domestic space or ceremonial space. And one of the most important personalities in 17th century to be linked now historically to the wearing of high heels is Louis XIV. Many people credit him with inventing the red heel, 
but he didn't. He was simply wearing a style that was already fashionable. But what he did seem to do, I still haven't found the smoking gun, is that he made it a stipulation within France that only those that he granted the privilege of access to his court got to actually wear heels. So he imbued the wearing of this type of footwear with a kind of political privilege or um, a, a statement, allowed the wearers to make a statement of political privilege. Of course, anybody visiting Europe um, could, of course, go home with a pair of red heels. And this became a point of contention, particularly as nationalism uh, grew between and ad uh, adversarial um, sensibilities grew between England and France. By the end of the 17th century, uh, another thing began to happen, which was emergent enlightenment thinking and new ideas about gender, one of which was that idealized femininity was evidenced by the small body. It should be no surprise that Cinderella, of course, is written at this time. Earlier in the century, men and women are imaged pretty much the same height, footwear, feet are about the same size, but by the end of the century, you end up with very, very, very tiny, tiny feet for women and very big, um, broad, uh, sturdy uh, images of men in their, in their large shoes or boots in this case. So for women, the heel began to, be, to also take on a purpose. If the origin of the heel was, to, um, it was for equestrian purpose, the purpose of the heel at the end of the 17th century and throughout really the 18th century was to hide the bulk of a woman's foot up under her skirts, almost like a tool that uh, Cinderella's stepsisters might have been interested in. And so the heel gets higher and higher, pushing and hiding the majority of a woman's foot under their skirts. And it also, by its placement, imparts structural to make sure that the high, the high heel could support a woman's weight. But it also ends up creating, as you can see from my cursor, a very truncated footprint, meaning that everything about the shoe is helping a woman achieve the goal of appearing to have very, very small feet. So heels are left to women in the 18th century Comments about men wearing heels are often just that comments. Men are made fun of it for wearing high heels or lambasted as being too Frenchified if you're looking at English texts. But the wearing of heels has basically um, vanished from men's fashion, with the exception, you know, they, they did wear a small heel, the way a businessman would wear a heel today. And women's desirability becomes linked to the wearing of this kind of accessory. This quote from 1781 is a perfect example. In ran lively Harriet tottering on her French heels with her head as unsteady as her feet. So female desirability was linked to, uh, to enlightenment concepts of irrationality. Heels off the horse being an irrational choice, one could argue, become the signifier of this type of female desirability. But they also come with a kind of risk the one place that women were told or society was warned about where women could exert some quote unquote power was through the use of sexual manipulation. Sexual desire was the place where men, it was argued, had no ability for rational thought. So women who could use fashion, who could use their irrationality to uh, inspire desire could in this theory um, control men. This is sort of how um, Marie Antoinette gets uh, a bad rap uh, during the French Revolution. But this idea that female dress and female um, manipulation could destabilize men is something that's going to be linked to the high heel and ideas of female power over and over and over again. After the French Revolution throughout Western Europe, women's heels were basically banished. I, new ideas of female desirability were linked more to uh, domestic duties, maternal focus and love, and their footwear becomes almost diaphanous. It's not meant for outdoor use. And so their engagement with the, with the world or their um, encouragement that if they want to participate in politics that they simply raise good citizens is something that is reflected in the fashions of the day, particularly uh, women's footwear. But for men, the heel makes a small, short, let's say, uh, return because 
like the high heel, which for women was banished because of its uh, associations with the aristocracy. Men's heels were also, I mean, sorry, men's um, breeches uh, breeches were also uh, dispensed with because of their aristocratic association. And the uh, pantaloon comes into fashion. It's knit. It's meant to create a very long and lean line. And that is achieved by a strap under the foot. But without the use of the heel, when gentlemen would walk, the strap would just slip off the back. So the heel was there to help anchor the strap so that this long, lean look could be achieved. But men who made use of this heel were very quickly lampooned, and so it left men's fashion relatively quickly. For women, after 50 years of being left at home, focused on uh, politics through child rearing, uh, many had had enough. And in the middle of the 19th century, there was an increased call for female enfranchisement. And this came along with other ideas as well, such as reform dress, ways of allowing women to engage with the outside world in, in ways that literally increased their freedom. And so while these statements and uh, ideas were being bandied about, fashion returned 18th century dress um, and I don't think it's any, I do think it is connected to women's increased ask for the right to vote with a reminder that when women are allowed to uh, have access to any sort of power that society has told us that women will use it to manipulate men. And so 18th century fashion comes back and is embraced for its beauty, but it brings with it ideas of what happens with uh, if you allow for female sexual manipulation. And so, of course, the courtesan becomes the central character of uh, 19th, late 19th century art and literature. Um, things that women can do if left uncontrolled. But women did want a vent. They wanted to be able to get out into the world. And so while many continued to argue for female enfranchisement, um, society offered women a new place that they could be seen in public, and that was the department store. All of a sudden, women could be seen about as long as they were consuming conspicuous consumption, which has been dealt with um, by Vavlin uh, quite well, is something that uh, really does capture society in the second half of the 19th century. And it also gives rise to the first couturier and one could argue one of the first shoe designers to have his name associated with um, the shoes that he made. Uh, Francois Pinet, this is a Pinet boot, um, was an industrialist who had his boots all hand embroidered and the women who could afford what worth also could afford Pinet. And so we have the, the later in the 20th century where named shoe designers become increasingly important, we have this moment to thank. For men, the use of heels remains um, impossible, especially when ideas such as Darwin's origin of the species begins to grab the attention of scientists and, um, and theorists in general that in some ways might makes right. And so man's natural height is what was desired, but it could not be achieved through the artifice of high heels. In fact, heels begin to be seen not only as a way for men to feminize themselves, but also as a way for men to call attention to what they lacked, which was natural height. For women, by the end of the 19th century, the high heel had actually become not only a signifier of femininity, but also a signifier of sexualized femininity. Girls no longer could wear heels. And as women fought for the right to vote at the turn of the century, whether or not they wore no heels, in which case they were considered desexed and unworthy of a vote as they were not even a gender, or they had used their sexual, their sexual manipula manipulation and feminine wiles to uh, attract men and uh, sort of manipulate them into creating the vote for women, high heels were central to this, this discussion. And eventually, of course, uh, women got the right to vote in many places. And interestingly enough, fashion for women in the 1920s dispensed with many aspects of dress that uh, sort of linked back to the 19th century. They cut their hair, they got rid of their corsets, 
Um, they began to wear makeup, but the one indispensable item now in the female wardrobe was the heel. So connected to ideas of ide idealized and desirable femininity that it could not be dispensed with. Another thing that happens in the 1920s with pop psychology, Freud sort of becoming uh, a part of the zeitgeist was this idea that women couldn't control themselves around fashion consumption, particularly shoe consumption, that women were shoeaholics, a term that of course dates uh, to the early 21st century, but is already a part of the thinking about femininity. And I just wanna point out that this also links back to 18th century enlightenment concepts about women. And so it's wearing a new guise, but it's the same old story. By the 1930s, eugenics is becoming increasingly important. Again, driving ideas of idealized men being naturally taller. This um, Jansen ad, you can see the man is a head taller um, to the female companion he's with, despite the fact that she herself has on a pair of heels. And so as height becomes of increasing importance for men uh, and with no ability to use heels to gain that added height, the elevator shoe uh, becomes very popular in the 30s. And this is where you have an insert placed into a man's shoe, which as this ad suggests, could increase your height secretly uh, by two inches. Another thing happens in the 30s that is quite uh, remarkable, which is a division between the desirable female and the fashionable female. So if the desirable female was high heel clad and now had been since the turn of the century at least, the, the fashionable female begins to play with different forms of footwear. Ferragamo, Perugia, and Vivier all bring the platform back. And men, um, according to articles of the day, hated these types of shoes. So you have a real division between what is desirable and what is fashionable. But by the time World War II hits, it would have been so interesting to see how footwear would have developed with this original schism, but the war um, really sort of made this difference uh, quite stark. So women on the home front were encouraged to be like Rosie the Riveter, to go get jobs, and to do so wearing practical footwear, to be the powerful women that they could be to help the war effort. But the image of femininity that men were fighting for overseas often was this uh, uh, bathing suit clad female, which I would argue at the end of her long legs assuredly wears a pair of high heels. So when the war was over, particularly in North America, this disconnect between Rosie the Riveter and the high heeled fantasy um, sort of clashes. And so the platforms of the 30s and the 40s is set aside and a new form of footwear is invented, and that is the stiletto heel. The stiletto heel was so thin and made of extruded metal, it required World War II technology to, in order to be achieved, could hold the weight of a woman and allow for a blade-like heel. And so the stiletto became, becomes a classic and embeds itself in men's erotica. Once again, in the 1960s, you have a bifurcation between the fashionable female who's now wearing these childlike low-heeled shoes and men's erotica. These are two images from the same year, from 65. And you can see this difference in style. The desirable female wears high heels, the fashionable female has uh, a shoe them. In the 1970s, we have a moment when men begin to embrace the heel one more time, but it is absolutely not a reclamation of women's heels or not even a reclamation, uh, uh, the integration of anything from the female wardrobe and more has to do with a reclamation of male fashion from the past. And so I think this is an apt comparison between Louis XIII, Louis XIV's father and Jean Simmons. Everything about their outfits and their heels speaks to a link across generations and you can see has very, uh, Jean Simmons look has very little to do with borrowing from the female wardrobe. In women's fashion, they too were the platform for a very short period of time, much more linked to uh, 1940s ideas of nostalgia, but within short order by the, by 76, 77, the heel is back in fashion. But when it comes back into fashion, this is a Jordan image um, for Jordan shoes, 
uh, it brings with it now, uh, it's now laden with erotic, male erotic um, connotations and currency and uh, sort of blends into ideas of the sexual revolution. By the 1980s, women are coming into the workplace uh, as white collar workers in numbers never seen before. And the dress of female authority is open for discussion. There is no men's suit. And anytime uh, women and power is discussed, uh, it's still discussed in terms of sexual manipulation. So women who simply wanted to be lawyers or doctors were encouraged to wear masculinized versions of, I mean, sorry, feminized versions of male attire and to wear heels, but heels that were neither too low to desex them nor too high to uh, eroticize them. And so you end up with this sort of middle heel. But for dressing like this, many, many women and their desirability was called into question. The 1986 Newsweek article about women um, who are more devoted to their jobs and not to marriage sort of took the world by storm and people began to fear that if women didn't get, that, that if women devoted themselves simply to doing a good job, that they would lose the access to having it all. They would never have um, families, husbands and children. So fashion offered the anecdote of a more hypersexualized look, either of the, the male suit um, or of the heel, which they just pitched a little bit higher. By the 1990s, ideas of erotic currency started to uh, formulate and, and people began to suggest that if female power could only be achieved through sexual, sexual manipulation, then perhaps women should own it. Stripper culture became uh, infused into aerobics, pole dancing, and stripper referencing footwear entered into high fashion as well. And in addition, in the 1990s, you had television shows such as Sex in the City, which were about, uh, reportedly about female empowerment and ideas in the media of women being shoeaholics. Here you can see these are expressions of financial health in that this is a closet full of $1,000 uh, designer shoes. But when Carrie Bradshaw opens her closet and says, I've wasted $40,000 of my money on shoes and I could have had a down payment. It just links these ideas of female irrationality and shoe consumption all the way back to early enlightenment concepts about female innate uh, irrationality. And so while they were purportedly about empowerment and ideas of women's power, the reality was this simply was a, a new version of an old trope in which shoes were central, or high heels in particular were central to this narrative. So these concepts of female power and high heels have continued to be, to be discussed in media. Sneakers have moved some of those discussions to the sidelines. And at the same time, there have been many men who are beginning to embrace heels in ways that are non-ironic and really do potentially speak to the potential for the power of the high heel. One of my arguments against female empowerment through high heel wearing is that they seem to, that, that power seemed to be limited to women. Power seems to be something that should be available to everybody and, and signifiers of power should be the same regardless of who wears it. And so seeing uh, Billy Porter's new collaboration with Jimmy Choo gives me hope that this type of footwear that is simply a thing uh, that meaning can be given to is about to be transformed into something that has cross-gendered meaning and potentially may also now for real be linked to ideas of power. Thank you very much.